everyone, and welcome to another episode of Nemeseek. And today we are going to do a fan commentary over 96 minutes of shitty filmmaking, in my opinion. Uh, this is the Resident Evil Retribution fan commentary from me. Uh, I've been doing all the live-action Resident Evil movies as we lead up to the new remake that's coming out uh, later this year at Thanksgiving. So we're going to try to get this one done with. I already recorded this once and had like massive audio issues. So I I wait I was like I'm going to wait a month before we record this again. So here we are a month later after I initially recorded my uh my fan commentary to do it again because of those audio issues. I'm like god dang it that sucks. So hopefully we don't have any problems this time and if we do I don't really care. I'm not watching this movie another time. Um, I, I really don't like this movie. This is the fifth Res Evil film in the franchise. Um, I do like Mila Jovich. I'm a big fan of hers. But these movies are just, I feel like they put a lot of hard work in all the wrong areas of these movies to, to make something that has the Res Evil name on it. Uh, they're very into filming action sequences, uh, you know, big fight scenes. In fact, there's a fight scene in this between Mila Jovich's character Alice and Jill Valentine that I think took like almost two weeks to film um, and not, not every day filming it obviously, but just uh, from start to finish, I think it took roughly about that time, like 12 or 13 days. Um, and that's just, that's ridiculous. That's the most, that's so absurd to me in, in, in so many ways. Um, there's been people injured on this movie. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that during the commentary where there was extras dressed as zombies and like a platform fell and people got injured. So we'll talk more about that later. And it, it's just like and then I think in the next movie, the sixth one, someone actually, um, I think, passed away or or, or maybe something or maybe someone in this movie passed away. And then the next one, the, the young lady lost her arm um, due to an accident. And it all comes from negligence, just people just changing things on the day, which you cannot do with stunts. So I think that's bad, obviously bad filmmaking, uh, laziness, trying to cut corners. Um, it, it's just too much. And I feel like that's pretty standard when you watch these movies. I'm like, it, it's this movie is not worth people getting injured over or people dying over. These movies are not spectacular. They are cash grabs at best. And, uh, and I know there are people out there that are fans of these movies, but I am not. I am not one of them, and I will not be nice, and I will not pull my punches uh, against Paul Anderson and the crew, Jeremy Bolt, and all the people that made this movie. Um, I won't, uh, because they're they're scumbags, some of them. <laughs> and, and some of the people that got injured that were trying to, like, you know, get, you know, help or, you know, sue or, you know, get insured or something like that. Like, there was a lot of drama behind the scenes with those injuries and those deaths, uh, you know, or that the one death, I think there was one death. Um, I could be wrong. It could have been more, but with all the behind the scenes stuff, everyone just acted like soulless, shitty, uh, business people and they had no empathy and no heart. And I understand that this is a business movie making, but, uh, you can at least have a little humanity in you. And I feel like some of these people that made the, these movies did not show that they had any humanity. Um, in, in the time where they had an opportunity to, they didn't. So yeah, I'm not going to be nice. I'm not going to pull my punches. I, I, I just straight up don't like these people. And I think what they did with the Resident Evil brand, even though, you know, these movies kind of made money, although at this point with this movie and the next one, that's when they, there was definitely a decline. Um, I think people were kind of just fed up with, you know, Alice being a character that we went, this is our fifth movie now with the character and we know very little about her. And then they try to cram all of her origin and story in the next movie and it's just so bad. So we'll get there when we get there for the final chapter. But for now, we're going to watch Retribution. So get your DVD ready. I'm on the, you know, the logo as the Screen Gems logo is about to pop up. It's in red. So it's like the time code is like zero, zero and like, you know, one second or something like that. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to do a three, two, one countdown. So I'll do three, two, one and hit, say play. And on play, watch along with me if you want. Or you can just listen to us as a podcast, whichever you prefer. So here we go. Three, two, one play all right so you can hear the helicopter and uh i think this is the screen gems yeah this is the screen gems logo popping up a sony picture entertainment company and this opening is so this movie so from a from a writing standpoint okay so some of you know that i've written comic books i've written a couple tv pilots some screenplays nothing major that like sold you know although some of the comics got published that i've worked on uh, but so I'm not, but I'm not here to say I'm an expert in writing, obviously, like, uh, you know, I'm just saying I can only tell things from my point of view and from things that I've learned from writing and from even from directing. Actually, there's this great book by Stephen Katz called Directing Shot by Shot. If you've never, ever read it, I highly recommend that you do. And I would even go far, even though I'm mean towards Paul W. Sanderson, who directed and wrote this film. 
and is married to Mila Jovovich in real life and they have kids together. Um, even though I'm mean towards the guy, like as his, 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 in some regards, I do think he has a pretty good eye when it comes to, to directing. And I, and I would even say he probably read the Stephen Katz directing shot by shot book, um, or more books like it. Uh, he's not terrible at his job in the sense that like, if you give him a budget and a time frame to film movies in like this movie took 55 days to film, I think for principal photography, that's pretty good. That's like, you know, a little less than two months to film this movie. And that's about average for a movie like this with a budget the size this movie had. So he can come in under budget. He can film on time. You know, even this shot where it's like in reverse and you have her going through the water with this music, it's wonderful. But then you get to this bullshit <laughs> where you go out of the water and you're literally seeing this entire action sequence backwards. Like they should have just stopped it there with the water scene. Um, but, uh, but, you know, he has to just go for it every time he's like i gotta make it bigger and louder and stupider um and i just hate it i do i really do um and milijovic she's beautiful she's a great actress um but she is terrible in these movies like she is so bad and that's i think that's because of the directing the writing especially the writing um but this uh you know this character of alice is a nothing character and you know, they always like they give her the bare minimum of like attributes or characteristics. Just it, it's I just blows my mind how I don't know, like lack of a character there is. But yet, you know, I like I said, I know there's fans of these movies out there and there's fans of of the Alice character, but she's not a character <laughs> like she's not. She does what the plot needs her to do. And that's it. That's not a character. There's a, and some people say, Oh, well there's emotion with there. And there's this, not really like they, they, they give her like, Oh, I have to protect this little girl. But she did that in the second movie. Kind of, it was supposed to be Jill's job to protect Angie. But then in this one, they're like, well, let's bring that back. And, uh, and, and that's what this movie is. This movie right here is a family reunion. This is what the, the, uh, fast and the furious franchise has, have become where it's like, we don't really care so much about making a good movie. We just want to bring all of our friends back and, uh, and, and get them work, you know, and, uh, and hang out with them again and have fun with them again. Like, meanwhile, you get to do that at the expense of 16 people being injured on this film set, a person dying, like, so I'm glad you got your reunion. Your friends got to come back together um, of characters that make no sense to be in this movie. And so we'll get there. Like we see they, they start listing them at the beginning, like, oh, Leon's in this and Jill's in this. And but none of them are really their characters, like not really. They're just they're just skins. It's like um, it, it's like taking a, it's like Fortnite, you know, in Fortnite, it's like, oh, you can put a Batman skin on your character or a Harley Quinn skin or a Venom skin. It doesn't really make them those characters. It's just a skin on top of like a default program. That's what almost every character in these movies are, especially at this point. The fourth movie had a little bit of um, like the afterlife, uh, afterlife, Resident Evil Afterlife. There was a little bit in that movie to where I was like, okay, there's enough here for me to kind of get something out of it as a fan, but I still had a lot of criticisms. This movie has nothing. Um, like for example, we are, we are like what, five minutes into this movie. We went through a, a long drawn out opening credit sequence that tells very little story. I mean, something you could have told in like 60 seconds, but they stretch it out to like a couple minutes. Now we have Alice narrating about the past four movies. And this is what I love and hate about these movies. I love it because I love making fun of it, but I hate it because I hate it. It sucks. They have these narration moments in these movies where Alice is like, hey, I'm Alice. I used to work for Umbrella. It's like she says the same shit. Like it's just Paul Anderson copy and pasting his script from the previous movie and then just adding a couple lines at the end. Um, but uh, but yeah, you have, and they. I think that's a recast actually of the Red Queen. Um, but you have Alice narrating. So it's basically the filmmakers going, hey, remember what we did in the previous movies? But then this movie has things that like kind of like wash over past movies. So they're like, so it's this constant state of, hey, remember what we did? Now forget everything we did. Um, and that's what drives me nuts. Because like in the second movie, they explain that uh, that the Ashford guy, Dr. Ashford um, is the one who kind of created the t-virus 
and was working with it to cure his daughter. And then the sixth movie, they said it was Dr. Marcus that created it and he was trying to help his daughter. And it's like, and then you find out that daughter, you will, you'll see, I don't want to spoil it. We'll get to final chapter, but, um, but they just, I don't know. I don't get it. I just, I don't get that. They're like, Hey, remember this? Okay, great. Well, in this movie, we're going to say a different doctor created the T virus. And in this movie, we're going to say this happened differently. And you're just like, Oh my God, whatever. And then also the other thing of it is the implausibility and the impracticality of the Umbrella Corporation. So if you remember in the video games, if you're a Resident Evil fan, um, the fourth video game opens with the Umbrella Corporation already gone, uh, which was very unfulfilling for me as a fan because I wanted to actually play the mission that took down the Umbrella Corporation. Like, because every game, like the second and third one, we're like, we got to stop Umbrella. Uh, Code Veronica, we have to stop Umbrella. And then Res Evil 4 opens and Res and uh, Umbrella was taken down by st stock losses. Like their stock went down and they went bankrupt. And you're like, okay, well, that's probably semi-realistic, but how boring, how boring for a fictional universe uh, to just say the stocks dropped. <laughs> um, so... So by the time we get to like the fourth and fifth video game, you're not really dealing with Umbrella too much. Uh, there's people referencing that they might try to bring Umbrella back, but that's it. That's all they do. Um, that's all they just say it. You know, they don't really show it too much. Um, so Umbrella's kind of gone mostly in the video games up until now. Like you're probably watching footage from Resident Evil 8 right now of one of my playthroughs through it. Um, and uh, and you're probably you know there's some mention of Umbrella in Resident Evil 8. But, uh, but in a different way, they're kind of like the good guys now. So Umbrella, like, so for them, for these movies to just focus on Umbrella as the sole entity, they keep coming up with these dumb things for Umbrella to be responsible for. For example, like that we just saw the opening sequence, we saw it in reverse, then we had a narration by Alice, then we saw the opening sequence sped up in forward motion, like, like in proper motion. Uh, so you see it happen linearly. And, uh, and so now we're, what, like eight minutes into the movie, and we are watching a clone Alice wake up in bed with Carlos and you're just, I'm just so baffled like the impracticality of this. So first of all, umbrella, they, they're like, we're going to release a virus. We find out in the sixth movie, we're going to release a virus around the world purposely. And all of us, one percenters and stock owners, we're going to hunker down underground and, uh, and wait it out. And then we'll release a, a cure in the air and that'll go all over the world, kill all the monsters, and then we can rebuild. The most impractical plan ever because those one percenters don't know how to like do drywall <laughs> and they don't know how to build anything or create things like that. Uh, it's just a bunch of you know rich people. Um, you're not going to rebuild society like that. It just, I'm sorry, rich people, but a lot of you don't have actual talents. Like, I'm sorry, you don't, you know how to just keep from going poor most of the time. Um, uh, you know, but that's it. That's, that's your one, one gift. <laughs> but these, uh, but this movie, like the, this umbrella corporation thing is like, that's what they do. They're just like, we're, we're, um, our employees are going to stay underground and we're going to wait out this virus. And so, but at the same time, we're going to spend trillions, if not quadrillions of dollars to build these fake facilities, fill them with clones of people um, and uh, watch them and then like, recreate outbreaks to, you know, it, it, just so we can see how fast the virus is going to spread. You could have just run computer simulations and then did like one test environment. Um, or you could have just used the data from Raccoon City when you built a wall around the city in less than 24 hours somehow. And uh, and you watch that city go to crap within 24 hours. That right there was your focus group um, because you didn't plan that outbreak. That was the other thing is they were like, we, we planned this outbreak. It's like, how? Spence decided that he was going to steal the virus and sell it on the black market. So like, how did you plan that? <laughs> like, that guy just independently did that. Um in the first movie. So these movies, like I said, they, they tell you, Hey, pay attention to what we did. And then, Oh wait, don't ask any questions though. Don't pay attention to what we did. Or as soon as you ask a question, they just go, well, what are you, why are you asking those questions? They're like, just, just sh 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 forget, forget. It's okay. Forget. And it's like, yeah, but you just told me to remember They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah but, but, but forget. It's fine. Yeah. 
So anyway, we have the scene here where there's supposed to be tension, but I don't think Paul W. Sanderson's very good at tension, um, where the, the ladder slides down and she's like, oh my God, so, so a zombie might have heard that. Um, and there you get the character's name, Becky, even though you, they said it earlier, but just some visual storytelling, which is good. I like that Mila's hands are shaking. That's, that's something. Um, that's not bad. Um, so, uh, this, so this scene, like I said, we're, we're like 10 minutes into the movie and we're not even with the real Alice. All of this is just to recreate Dawn of the Dead, like the, the remake, like this is literally almost identically to the opening of Dawn of the Dead, uh, the remake by James Gunn and uh, Zack Snyder. And then coincidentally, Michelle Rodriguez is like, get in, get in. So when I earlier when I scoffed at the idea that that Mila's Alice character is married to Carlos, it's like, why? Why would Umbrella do that? Like, first of all, they didn't know, like Carlos was a random mercenary that they hired in the second movie to go in to clean out people in Raccoon City. Do they take blood samples of everyone they hire and then put them into this simulation? But even still, that means they created all this stuff after the Raccoon City incident, which is when all the one percenters would have been down underground. So because how, otherwise this simulation has been running since before the outbreak of Raccoon City. So Alice and Carlos have been married in the simulation during the outbreak of Ra like I'm just I don't get it because they say they run the simulation like thousands of times to, to you know and they're still running it even now after um after the world has been destroyed and I think that's because they said the Red Queen in this facility that we're going to get introduced to here in like 30 minutes whenever the hell we get to the actual story of the movie um that Red Queen has gone off the grid and is thinking for itself and it's like but is it? Because in the next movie, it's not. It's still working for them. <laughs> you see what I mean? Like, th this is, and I know some people are going to be like, oh, dude, you're reading too much into it. You're, and it's, you know what? If you think that, fuck you, honestly. Um, this franchise, like, it may not be, Resident Evil, the name itself, may not be some, like, it's not, it's not like Oscar contender material, for sure. But it can still be a clever, interesting horror movie um, with some action scenes. It can still be that. It can still have decent writing in it. The problem is, is that they write these movies um, for the world, which is not, I guess that's not, I wouldn't say that's a problem uh, because I do have friends in other countries that like these movies because they're, it's easy to just follow. Um, sometimes if you do too many nuanced things or too many subtle things that one territory of the you know the world will get like somewhere in America might get or a type of humor that only you know people in England will get like if you if you do that too much you are in a way you know restricting the potential audience you could get but I still feel like it's smart to do what's best for the story and the characters because at the end of the day, that is your job as a filmmaker is that and in hopes that that leads to money making. These movies, I feel, are just them going algorithm, uh, you know, focus group. You know, it's like it's all these things with and then other countries and they just go, OK, here's what worked in the last movie with other countries. And it's like some easily digestible scene. And they go, we need more scenes like this in this movie. And it's just all that's what it feels like. It's like it's going off of numbers and percentages and not so much creativity. Although I will say, even though I dog on this movie, I'm not going to say it's not creative in some ways. Like there's certainly, it's, it's, it's interesting, the concept of this, uh, but at the same time, I also feel like it's a lazy concept too. But visually, they're kind of creative with it, but it's still a lazy concept. It's basically a video game. They're like, all right, we have Alice wakes up here. So now we are finally getting introduced to the, the main Alice after we saw her in reverse and narrating in the opening. We're finally getting to see her in an umbrella lab, which does look cool. It's a neat set for sure. Um, I think most of the floor is, I think it's mostly green screen actually. It looks good. Um, and uh, the, the whole, I don't know, the whole like 
visuals of this lab and stuff, like I said, look look creative and neat. Um, but then again, we get right to more pointless storytelling. Like we get, you know, Jill, who's some kind of brainwashed Jill, um, b- because of the scarab on her chest, which they already established in a previous movie, brainwashes you. Um, and Alice knows that, but she's not saying like, Jill, take the thing off your chest. She's just, they're just asking useless questions to each other. Like Jill's like, why did you turn on Umbrella? Umbrella doesn't care why Alice turned on them. <laughs> like actually they know why when you get to the next movie, they reveal that they know why. They know why the real Alice, uh, because this is a clone one. Uh, and then now they're asking her, who do you work for? It's like, so I don't know if the point of this is to ask her questions she can't answer um, just so they can torture her longer. So maybe maybe that's it, but that's to me seems too clever for Paul W. Sanderson. This just seems like straightforward, terrible dialogue. And that's what they are going for. Because, <laughs> like, what do they want from her? Like, uh, like why keep her alive? Um, and then they, I don't know. Then they say they the reason they keep her alive is, you know, because, like, Wesker... Well, they don't say this, but you can. I guess you can kind of connect the dots that, okay, this Red Queen has not really gone off the reservation. They captured her, and then they, and then Wesker is like going to try to break her out using Ada, which is something that happens in the games where Ada works for Wesker temporarily. Um, and that they're all, you know, that Wesker and Ada and Umbrella all have the same goal. They got to get Alice out so they can bring her to Washington to do something. But then you see in the next movie that there was nothing to do in Washington. It was, it was pointless. She's got to go to Raccoon city. So why not just le- lead her to Raccoon city from here? <laughs> like I said, it's cause Paul Anderson doesn't think about what he's going to do next. He just does something now. And then when the next thing comes, he goes, well, I don't care what I've done before. I got to focus on the now. And that's exactly how his mind thinks. And that to me is what makes him probably one of the worst screenwriters ever next to maybe Uva Bowl who's just an all-around, Uva Bull's all-around bad filmmaker. Paul Anderson, I think, has some talents, but he is a bad writer. Probably one of the worst. Um, Sienna Galori, who plays Jill, is a great-looking Jill. I know a lot of people are fans of hers, but she is not a very good actor in these movies either, and that is, I again, because of the, the directing, I feel. The face she makes when she stands up, like, I, it's so I know she's supposed to play an automaton essentially someone who's brainwashed but it's so bad and then again why send the laser grid down just to get it in as a cameo really why send it down if the door is just going to open up and let her out like so do you want Alice to live or not you know and obviously that's the work of um, Ada hacking into computers to like you know help her out or whatever the hell but it's it's just because I can answer the question doesn't make it any better. <laughs> like it's so bad. Um, and like I said, look at the amount of money that Umbrella is spending to recreate Tokyo, uh, Shibuya Square. Like they're spending all this money. They fill it with clones. Um, they put real loaded guns in these cop cars. Like everything's so authentic and everything like that out of all the simulations that car window's never been busted before that gun's never been picked up by before um it's it's so it's so bad and watch ready she could like there should be she should be able to see like a thousand people around her right um but watch so like she's she's looking around she's like What's going on? There's just lights. Lights are turning on. Rain is coming on. And then boom, just people. Like they just appeared in front of her because she's, it's not like she noticed them walking up, you know, three minutes before this because you saw her walking a while before she got to this cop car. And look at this guy. He's like, my, my car has been busted. And there's a lady standing there with a gun and he's not reacting. And then they brought this actress back who plays J pop girl. Um, that's all they could think of creatively to name her is just J pop girl. She's the literal first zombie of the outbreak and they call her J pop girl because Paul Anderson doesn't give a shit. (laughs) That's pretty much what it is. Um, 
Yeah, so this is a simulation. Now, if the simulation is a bunch of people programmed to do the same thing and not independently think, then how could the Alice that was trying to protect the kid married to Carlos, how did they, how were they able to independently, you know, get attacked or killed in different areas through every simulation? This is literal footage from the fourth movie reused, by the way. And look, she's just standing there. She, she didn't stop it. She, she's not shooting zombies. Like, these are clones of people, right? But yet, she's not trying to save any of them. Um, it, it, I don't know. It's like it's like that scene in uh, Batman vs Superman where everyone's dead and Superman is just standing there going, "Ah, oh, man, I screwed up." And it's like, yes, you did, but you can still use like your cool breath and try to put out the fires right now and help people right this second instead of just standing there and having a pity party for yourself. Um, and that's Alice was just doing there. It's I don't know. God, this movie. I I hate almost every second of this movie. Like I said, it's shot pretty well. Like this is a nice setup. The fight scene is neat, um, but it's it, it's other than that. That's like that's all I can give it credit for. I think one of the fight choreographers of this movie he worked on the Last Samurai, um, which again, like I don't know if, if someone was like, "Hey, you're directing Resident Evil. Um, you know who would you like to work with, or we can get you these people to do stuff." I would probably not hire the guy who did the Last Samurai because I wouldn't put a scene like this in a Resident Evil movie where someone's using kung fu to like take everyone down, uh, all the zombies down. It takes away so much tension. It, it's like, yeah, it looks neat, but you know, I, I you know, and some, I can, I can respect the, um, the craft, I should say. I don't know. I don't want to say it looks neat. I don't like it. Uh, but I can respect the craft that people worked really hard to bring scenes like this to life. But, uh, why? Like, why is she doing matrix moves where she kicks a, you know, like, um, a clip of bullets at a zombie's head and what, the, the clip hit the zombie's head and caused it to stop moving. Like it, it backed up. It's like, yeah, but a zombie would probably not even feel a, a, you know, that hit its face. Like it would just keep moving in a straight line. It would stumble forward. Um, but that's also like this movie changes the zombie thing. Like in the video game, they explain that when zombies have these, um, when they have these like plant, like, uh, um, petals or like whatever the, the it's like these, like, these, I don't know what they're called. They're, they're like, uh, they look like, like, um, long leaves, but they like f open up like a flower and they come out of their mouths. Um, it's supposed to be Las Plagas, which is like a parasite that they find in Spain that they, um, weaponize and turn into a, to make a new form of smart zombies in a way. Um, but in these movies, they don't ex see like this, that, that thing coming out of her mouth right there out of J pop girl's mouth. Um, those squid tentacle things with teeth on the end that look like open up like a plant. Um, the thing that sucks about those is like the movies don't explain what that is. And in the game, that's a completely different virus. So it's not even part of the T virus. Um, so I don't know. I could the, so these movies are even lazy when it comes to that. It's like Paul Anderson just goes, Oh, I saw this happen in the game and this happened, but he doesn't understand the context of it. Like he just, Again, like in my opinion, a little bit like Zack Snyder with the Superman and uh, DC movies, uh, at least with Man of Steel and which I, I don't hate Man of Steel and I don't hate Batman versus Superman. I'm kind of 50 50 on them. But there are some scenes in those movies where I'm critical of Zack, where I feel like he he took the visual, but he didn't understand the context of that visual uh, from the comic. Um, and so that's what Paul Anderson, I think, is a lot. He's like, oh, I saw the, this happen in a game, but he doesn't understand the context of how it happened in the game. So he just throws it in the movie with, with, uh, because he thinks it looks cool. And I understand sometimes it's okay to do that. You, it, you can go like, Hey, you know what? This looked kind of cool. Um, I want to put it in the movie, but you should at least understand why, um, it exists in the source material before you translate it. In, in my opinion, but what do I know? I'm just one guy. Uh, this scene here where everyone's desk comes out of the floor is so fucking stupid. I'm sorry. Why does why does Umbrella have things like features like that where everyone's just desk they they just go under <laughs> under the ground. <laughs> and again, you could say that this lab itself was run by the Red Queen, so it doesn't treat people like people. Okay, then why? Do, but why doesn't Alice treat people like people? She could have just saved like an, a handful of clones back there and brought them into this room and armed them all and give all of them a better chance at, 
at, you know, surviving. Uh, this fight scene here, this is recreated from the video game. Uh, Paul Anderson loves to do that. He did that in the fourth movie um, with uh, Chris and Claire fighting Wesker at the end of the movie. In this one, you have Alice fighting um, Ada here to introduce Ada. But in the video game, it was Leon fighting Ada. But it was almost shot for shot the same. This reveal, um, Ada, he, she's like, do you know who I am? And she's like, yes, you're Ada Wong. You work for Albert Wesker. It's like she gives us all the exposition. So, like, Alice is never, su like, really surprised by anything um, to an extent. She, like, when whenever things get overwhelming, she easily gets out of it. She acts panicked when she ran down that hallway to get away from the horde of zombies. But she could have taken, she would have taken all of them on. Like, it's, it's so dumb, the you know the level of everything and look look we're seeing things in reverse again she just comes in and shoots everyone no one stands up to shoot her back and uh and then somehow the desks went back under the floor and alice should have just walked in and saw this um <laughs> whatever man i don't care i don't care i'm just <laughs> it's like i'm just and i know i know there are people out there that are fans of these movies that look that are like look man i just like what I see, the visuals are nice, uh, the action's fun. I'm not here for a good story, you know, and you shouldn't be either. It's Resident Evil, and again, if you if you feel that because it's Resident Evil that I that I'm asking for too much for a, even a slightly better story, like literally go fuck yourself. This franchise deserves better writing. Yeah, the visuals are fine, and the actors are fine. They do their job. Whatever. I'm not gonna dwell too much on that as as i'm going to more dwell on the fact that the writing is bad and that no one's a real character and the yes this franchise deserves better than that so i'm sorry if you're a fan of these and you're you're getting butt hurt because i don't like them and i'm pointing out all these things that i think are flaws you can still disagree with me and we can still be friends <laughs> like we can still both love resident evil that's what i always say about uh, franchises like i mentioned earlier Zack snyder and superman and stuff I'm glad there are fans of that out there, just like I'm glad there are fans of the Resident Evil movies. Um, because every time there's a new version of something and it has a fan base, that just keeps those things around longer. So, yeah, I'm not a fan of these six Resident Evil movies, but I'm also glad there are six of them. Um, I see the positives in these movies, but I also see a lot of negatives. And like I said, not just like some of the positives, not just filmmaking wise, like you have a female led action series um, successful in six movies that's pretty awesome normally um only like steven seagal and like fast and the furious movies get this many uh sequels you know um so to have a movie led by miljovic get this many sequels and be successful is great so i think that's good overall for you know movies in general i just wish these were better movies that got her to that level of success um it's a shame to me that it that these aren't better movies, and there doesn't doesn't take much to make them better movies, in my opinion. Just a better script would have been fine. Because here we literally have Wesker explaining, "You are all in a video game. You're in stage one, and the next stage is Russia, and the next stage after that is you know Moscow, and the next stage after that, or I'm sorry, Moscow and Russia, it's the same place. But the you were just in Japan, and now you're going to go to Russia, and then you're going to go to Raccoon City. That's what I meant to say. Um, so yes, like so, it's just him explaining that there are different levels and you got to go through the levels and fight the bosses and it's like he's literally explaining to them hey you're in a video game and uh and it's as much as i like meta humor and 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 uh, awareness this is not the kind that i like this is bad and look how look at this place that would cost trillions of dollars to make trillions but for what to just have a place to recreate virus outbreaks why and then the virus, let's say it's that's built underwater. The virus gets out. It contaminates the water then, right? Which is funny because in the fourth movie, at the beginning, they say all the water. I'm sorry, the third movie. It takes place in a desert. And they say all the water around the world has dried up. But in the fourth movie, we saw water. And now we literally see them underwater with ice on top of it. So what, did the water come back? Like, you see what I mean? Like, I know some people say, like, don't. You're not supposed to dwell on these things. You're not supposed to read that much into it. It's like, then, yes, you are, actually. You actually are. You actually are supposed to feel like you're immersed in this world, and the world has to make some semblance of sense. I'm sorry. It does. 
And this movie is the opposite of that. It's just laziness. Uh, it's just, let's just do whatever we want um, without thinking about what came before and what's going to come next. It's terrible. You're so bad. Like, these guys are bad. The guy who plays um, Leon, um, and this is Barry. It's supposed to be Barry. And then they bring the, the basketball player from the fourth movie back. Um, but you're like, again, why? Like, why? And then, okay, you're going to bring him back. So why don't you give us a story of how he ended up with these guys? But they don't. They, he gives, like, one or two lines in exposition, and that's it. And then, again, why does why does Umbrella have clones of – uh, Michelle Rodriguez and uh, one um, from the first movie, the, the the black guy who gets killed in the the hallway. Um, like, why does why is Umbrella keeping those people and Carlos? Like, why does it have clones of them? It, it just doesn't it doesn't make any sense. Luther, that's this guy's name. Luther, the basketball player. I was trying. I was like, what's his name? What's his name? And I was like, oh yeah, Luther. Um, who I like. I actually like Luther. I liked him in the fourth one. I thought he had a little, he has some charisma. He has some charm. Um, you know, so he worked for me in the fourth one. So I'm glad he lived, but then they bring him back in this one and he, he doesn't really do much. It's got to still be cold. I like that these guys are like, let's, uh, let's take... Let's take uh, off our jackets. And it's like, yeah, but why don't you wait till you get to the bottom where it might actually be a little warmer? Um, the guy who plays Barry Burton, Kevin Durant, I actually think he would be a great Barry Burton. The problem is, is that Barry Burton is literally, like I said, just a skin. They're like, hey, we're going to put you in a white t-shirt and a red vest and you're going to be Barry. And then he's going to literally do nothing that is Barry-like. Yeah. Because I'm curious. I'm like, the Red Queen helps Alice in the sixth movie. So why would it prevent her from getting out of this one? Now, I understand each lab has a different Red Queen, kind of. But the sixth movie explains that all the Red Queens are one. That stuff there with um, Wesker... Like, Wesker is... um his scenes are so bad. Like he's, he's clearly shot against a green screen and it's, it comes across like a, you know, like a roller coaster. Like when you're in a queue line of a roller coaster and they're like, no, don't go any further. The mummy's up there. And then you got to like, and then the, the, the feed breaks, you know, cuts out. It's like, it just, it gets like ripped right out of that. And it's like, yeah, I'm sorry. I, maybe you want me to feel like I'm going on a roller coaster through this movie, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not at all. This movie is the opposite of a roller coaster. This movie is like the equivalent of watching paint dry. That's neat. That was actually a neat like that's a that was actually a clever way to get rid of those guys. I mean, although that it fired a little too soon, it, it could have shot them while they're still on the lift. Um, but still, it it was neat. Neat idea for sure. But yeah, these guys, this team of like rescuers, just generic. The subs are neat because that was Code Veronica. Wesker had a sub in Code Veronica. Um, the reason, the this right here, where guys are getting shot off the top like that, that's uh, definitely from Resident Evil Five. Um, there was a lot of that where there was guys hanging on rafters and stuff. You had to pick off. In fact, if you do some of them in certain orders, you can unlock um, special treasures. I think. Yeah, and they, that was them trying to get some background to Umbrella. They're like, oh, Umbrella stole these from Russia, these uh, these submarines. Uh, they were used, you know, they're anti-nuclear submarines or whatever, and, and Umbrella used this to transport the virus all over the globe. And it's like, but wait, so what happened? Did the virus transfer around the globe and get out that way, or was it just Raccoon City? Like, it's, it's such a mess, these movies. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, clearly it's probably just that's how they transported viruses to different stations that they had around the world. But it's, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's unnecessary. Like I said, they focus their energies on the wrong things, just the wrong things. Like They do a lot of things where you're like, who cares? Who cares about this? Like, why are you doing this? Why don't you focus on characters and, and telling some background, giving them something, giving them more than just, you know, the bare minimum. Like these monsters, they're, um, they're specifically created in the games, much like a nemesis and stuff like that. Um, but, but yet in this, they're just like activate this monster and then they, they come out the executioner, but you don't get like any other, you know, backstory. You don't, they don't talk about Plagas or anything like that. They just, just two monsters show up. It's like, Oh, remember in the last movie you fought one in the shower. Well, now there's two tension. And it's like, no, there's no tension because both of these ladies are like Kung Fu masters with superpowers. So no, there's no tension. This is gonna, this is gonna, um, you know, end the way we all expect it to. All those shots were headshots though, by Alice with those two guns. Look at that. Those things would be dead. You're just blowing through its brains. Like, and they show only like six, uh, six holes in its mask. It's like, no way she shot submachine guns into it. And see like this, like when you play rock music, dun -dun 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 -dun, while this is happening, you cut out all the tension, no tension here. That could have been a really tense scene where Ada is trying to crawl through the, the bus and that thing is cutting through to her, you know, and it's like trying to get her. That could have been a tense scene, but because they have to make like a music video out of it with rock music, it's like, it takes away. And like I said, I know people are like, no, but these are just action. Like you're still wanting horror seek. Why are you doing that? These are action movies. You're right. By this point, they've established themselves as action movies. Um, you are correct. Um, and, but so my criticism may seem unfair to you in that regard. I should expect them to do more actiony stuff and less horror stuff by this point. But I still look at the franchise it originated from. And, you know, the problem is, is all these interviews before each of these movies come out, the actors and producers talk about, oh, we did this and this added the horror and we wanted to balance the horror with the action. And it's like there, that's why I get mad about the horror because there is none in these movies. Uh, and the producers say there is, they're like, oh, we balanced it better. We did this better. Like, like the games, we have equal horror and equal, you know, um, action and we have tension and, but they don't have any of that in these movies. They're, they're wrong. In my opinion, you may think there is tense horror mo moments in this. Um, I just, I don't. Lost Plagas undead. And the other thing is like the Red Queen is is omnipresent, right? She's uh she's in every room of this facility, and yet she's attacking her problems one at a time. It's so awful and uninteresting. She's like, Okay, Alice survived. Well let's let's activate Moscow and send Lost Plagas monsters after these guys. It's like she should have already been on to these guys the second they landed. Um, and she should have already been dealing with them as the executioners were dealing with, you know, or fighting Alice and Ada. So these are just all things like, you know, when you, when a script is being written, normally you have people give you feedback, right? Like, oh, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. I feel like in this Paul Anderson, it just, I know it's not true because I, I, I it can't be true. I can just tell you what it feels like. It feels like he wrote a first draft and then nobody questioned it and they just filmed it. That's what it feels like. They were like, hey, this guy's made enough money for us at this point. We're not going to give him a ton of notes. And that's usually how it happens in Hollywood. If you can make a studio money, they kind of back off you a little bit. Like they'll, they'll involve themselves a little less uh, sometimes. And uh, But in this case, it feels like it. It feels like nobody stepped in to talk sense to a shitty script. They just all accepted it. 
Um, and that's, that's terrible. That means, in my opinion, producers didn't do their jobs um, and uh, actors didn't do their jobs. Uh, I would have, they did their jobs in the sense they showed up and said their lines. Um, and that was, that was their version of doing their jobs, but they didn't go like, Hey, I want to bring this to the character. I want to bring this like Mila probably does. She probably comes in and says, I want to dress a certain way, or I want to do this. Cause some of these movies she did after having kids, which is crazy. She looks great in all these movies. And I can't imagine the type of strength that you're, that's needed to, you know, after you have a kid to get back into shape and then get into a, sh a shape enough to do a movie like this. So I commend her. I'm not blind to the hard work that gets put into these things sometimes. But um, but like I said, I feel like all the hard work goes into everything but screenwriting and character development. And to me, I think those are two things that could have made this franchise even better. Like they tout and, and, and praise themselves and pat themselves on the back for taking six movies to make a billion dollars. But I'm like, yeah, but if you made four really good Resident Evil movies those four could have made you a billion dollars. Like you could have done $50 million budgets for, for four different movies, maybe increase it a little bit. That's what they did. I think these movies roughly had between 40 and 70 million over the course of the seven movies. Each movie went up a little bit more. Um, so they kept their budgets down, which is good. And they made a profit, which is good. That's what you want to do. You don't want to spend $200 million in a Res Evil movie. That's stupid. Um, you want to spend less than a hundred million if you can, like definitely less than a hundred million. Um, and you want that return on investment. You want something like Venom, where Venom costs $100 million to make, and then you spend about another $100 million to market it, but then it makes n almost $900 million in the, in the box office. That's a huge profit. I mean, granted, they don't get to keep all of that $700 plus million over the $200 million. They don't get to keep it all, but, um, but they get to keep enough to where it's considered a massive success. You can do that with Resident Evil with a better script and more character development. You can and I know that's uh, Venom is not a good example in that regard because Venom definitely needed help on the script. And but the thing is, Tom Hardy committed to the role of the character, and I would argue that Alice does too. Even though I don't really like the what she does with the character to an extent because she's not really a character. Uh, I think Tom Hardy did more things that were actual characteristics um, for Eddie Brock, but. Alice does she and Mila does fine for Alice and I think that's why a lot of people like these movies is they just like her and they like her um her portrayal of the character which I you know again I don't agree with the portrayal of the character part but I agree that Mila is easy to like um she's easy to like and um and she's you know she kicks ass man and at the end of the day that's sometimes that's enough for people and that's okay if you like these movies, I'm not shitting on you. I just get mad when people tell me that I'm looking for too much in these movies because I'm not. I'm not looking for an Oscar-nominated film. I'm not looking for anything intense like that or extreme like that. I'm just looking for something with a better script and better characters. That's all. I'm literally asking for a step above the bare minimum. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah. But, no, if you like these movies, great. Continue to like them. Um, you know, rewatch them every year if you want. I, know I have a friend who um, she watches these, uh, I think every Halloween. She watches like one every like couple days leading up to Halloween. It's like her ritual, which is cool. I have a Halloween ritual too. I, I, there's like three or four movies I watch leading up to Halloween. So not these movies. <laughs> it's def not these. I watch like The Crow, Nightmare Before Christmas, um, Trick or Treat. I'm a big fan of Trick or Treat. So a little bit of visual storytelling there, and you have to do it because with Mila, you can't get, I don't know, Paul Anderson can't seem to get like real emotions out of her as a, as an actress, like, which is crazy because Mila is a great actress, but when she gets hugged by the little girl, she just stares like, huh, weird. But so I like that they give her like a child to look after that as a concept alone is great. 
The problem is they kind of already did it in a previous movie, and then in the next movie they ignore this little girl who does survive at the end of this, but then quote unquote dies off panel or off screen in the next movie. It's ridiculous. Um, her eyes being umbrella eyes is stupid. <laughs> like, like they put like some kind of contact robotic contact lenses on her or something. When she says all heart, you haven't changed a bitch. And it's like, what are you talking about? You lo you liked her in the first movie. You two were friends before she died. You said no heart, you haven't changed it. It's like, what are you talking about? And then, yeah, having the team there, one and stuff, like, I don't know. I don't get it. I don't get why they brought those. They brought them back because Mila wanted to work with all these actors again, which is fine. It's a business, and I know you want to be like, hey, I want I want to work with these guys again. I like them, and we we basically just need kind of mindless you know grunts in this movie so maybe by putting people that have been in previous movies in it they won't seem like mindless grunts but they are like you could have replaced michelle Rodriguez's character and um and the guy who plays one and carlos you could have exchanged them with anyone because they don't really bring anything to the table leon and barry and that crew um and luther and stuff like Luther brings a little bit because when he sees Mila, they at least act like they remember each other, which is good. Some movies, characters act like they don't remember each other. Um, but uh, but they don't, again, they don't do much. And then you have like Jill, who is clearly po being possessed and brainwashed. And there's not a single moment where, where um, Alice is trying to save Jill. So like, so you would think that would be a top priority for her where she's like, you know what? There is another ally we can have. And, you know, and maybe Ada's like, what are you talking about? There's no one else. Um, and she's like, no, look, you know, and Ada has to know that that thing on her chest is a brainwashing thing on the thing on Jill's chest. So to me, I'm like, that should have been something she said to Alice. Like, Hey, if we take that device off of your friend, you know, we can save her. And then Alice goes, Oh, I know my friend Claire had that happen to her. But again, she acts like she's never seen one of those devices before. But to me, if she was a smart character or she had, or if she was a real character uh, at all, she would look at Jill, see the device and go, okay, we need to get that off my friend. Um, and if we do that, maybe we can have another ally because we're in an impossible situation here and we're outnumbered, but there's no sense of that. Like there's no, like we got to save Jill. And that's the thing the fifth video game had. Chris was like, I got to save Jill. I don't want to shoot her or kill her. I want to find out why she's acting this way. And when he finds out it's the device, he's like, we got to rip it off and save her. Because Chris is a character. Even in Resident Evil 5, which is a shit game for the most part. Um, with characters like this in it, with the chainsaw. <laughs> that's from Resident Evil 5. But, uh, but yeah, but Chris is an actual character. Uh, Alice doesn't come across as one ever she has a sense of like hey i gotta protect this little girl great and see this is a neat concept this is a good reason to bring Michelle Rodriguez back. Look, she's a clone and she's not a soldier. So we're going to get something different out of her. We're going to find out who this character is. Um, she's more than just a soldier. There's something else. Um, so great. What a great setup. And then they do pretty much nothing with her as a, as a regular person. Oh yeah, and Alice knows sign language. See, I don't know, cloning doesn't work this way. Like if, if, if someone makes a clone of me right now and then that clone goes off and learns sign language in like the span of six months or a year and then that clone dies, I don't automatically know sign language. <laughs> so, so does like, did Mila know sign language before? And I'm gonna say no because none of the other movies establish that even though there was no other deaf characters in previous movies they still didn't establish that she knows sign language um but so it's just one of those things where 
we talk about the term Mary Sue. I don't really like that term. I know it's very negative and it can be used incorrectly, but I don't know how else to describe Alice other than a Mary Sue. She can do everything that's needed to be done at the moment it needs to be done without any real explanation or training. They just say she's the best trained. They just say that. But then if you go watch, like you watch the sixth movie, you find out she's just a clone of a woman with progeria. So what do they do? Like implant her with training skills? And I know she gets superpowers from, you know, like the, the T virus or whatever, but those were apparently were ripped out of her in the last movie. So in this movie, she's supposed to have no powers. So you can't even use that as an argument because she doesn't get her powers back till the end of this movie, which apparently can just be given to her with a simple injection and it can be taken away with a simple injection. So, So yeah, that was not that was almost a good scene where he's like, "You wait, you saw Ada die," and she's like, "No," and and actually, Mila showed like like a genuine emotion there. She was kind of like like confused, like and, and like eh, no, not really. I didn't see her die. But then he goes, "She always has a plan," and you're just like, "Why is that the? <laughs> why is that the response?" Uh, like I don't know. He could have just stayed silent and bobbed his head, like, you know, yeah, she's all right. She always has a plan. <laughs> We're, uh, what, like 50 minutes into this movie? And I want to stop it. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard that on a commentary track before. Um, they, we're, we're halfway through this movie, and I want to stop watching it. Um, this is a, this chase sequence here uh, has all these uh, Las Plagas zombies, I guess, riding dirt bikes. Um, chasing Mila and uh, and her team of friends in a whatever that nice car is that they're driving that can apparently just plow through that. My favorite thing is she just plowed through a van. Look at the minimum amount of damage on this car. Um, the uh, it's it's on fire right now and stuff, but you'll see it'll like. I think when it pulls up, it, it stops and, oh, wait, no, there's actual char on there. Never mind. I thought there was a shot where it just, the, the hood of the car looked like flawless. Um, but maybe that was a scene earlier when she pulled up. Uh, maybe I'm just, yeah, misremembering. I'm remembering out of order. That's that's fair. I'll, I'll take the L on that one. So, yeah, this car does look pretty banged up. I, I For some reason, I thought the car was still going to look good. But I, that, I think that's just because I saw that shot of the car when it first pulled up. Um the uh the, the the liquor by the way this super liquor that's coming in it looks badass uh again it's one of those things where i wish they would bring some new monsters in these movies but it's almost like the resident evil games how the newer ones kind of reuse assets a little bit um these movies do too they're like hey we already have the makings in visual effects of a executioner monster and a liquor so why don't we just use that it keeps the budget down not a bad way to keep your budget down but um, but still it's kind of like, I'd, I'd like a little variety. There's a lot of monsters from the games that just never made it into the movies, uh, which is a real shame because there's a lot of great monsters in the game. So yeah. Okay. So I was dead wrong for some reason. I don't know why I thought this car didn't look this beat up, but man, does it look effed up? So I'm going to retract, um, the, you know, the, the comment I was making earlier, um, they beat the hell out of that car. For some reason, I was thinking they didn't. Um, but uh, like I said, my my I can't really hold visuals in my head. Uh, like you know, if a visual pops up on screen, I can't really hold it uh, in my head. So uh, so I think while I was speaking, I saw the car pull up and it looked good. And for some reason, I was in the middle of a thought and it and I connected that dot and was like, oh, the car's gonna look fine later. But uh, so yeah, so just to give you an explanation of of my, my stupidity, but I'm still stupid. So I'll take the L on that. Oh boy. I have glasses and they tell me alternate routes. 
Yeah, because that's what Ada gave her. So that's how Ada was able to make it down. So that that is a plot point that makes sense. Um, but I like how everyone. I just like the stare Luther gave her. Like, what do you? Do? She's like, I I know what to do. And she pulls out glasses and puts them on. He's like, What the hell? <laughs> He's like, That's not an answer. Um, so this is like a super, super liquor. Remember at the end of the first movie, the liquor like evolved after it ate Spence uh, for some reason. It evolved. Um, so this one looks like one that evolved even past that. But then because Paul Anderson, like I said, he's such a bad writer, um, he just starts throwing things in here from aliens. Like he's like, okay, so we have a little girl here, so Mila's got to protect her, much like aliens. And then the little girl's going to get captured and put in like a little web thing by the monster, much like aliens. And then I think even a little mouth comes out of the liquor. I found, I may be misremembering that too. So if so, I'll take the L on it. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's just like he just does things because aliens did it. That shot there, going up the little ladder onto the platform, that's a, that's a great Resident Evil shot. That, this looks like from a Resident Evil game. Then you get to this and it looks like, you know, a, a big dumb action movie. Which I guess this is, so perfect. I actually like that. He he was like, hold on a second. Let me run up and look down the stairs because that's where they shot the guards earlier and they didn't look down the stairs. And that's why they got shot. So this is them going like, all right, we're going to we're we're gonna look down the stairs. I, like, I, I like that. It was a little thing, but it's pretty good continuity. So this is neat because it's other characters trying to figure things out instead of Alice. Because normally Alice would just jump in and say like, uh, oh, it's this. Let's do this. Um, but uh, but she's kind of sitting back right now while the guys are trying to figure it out. But they can't figure it out, so now Alice is going to come over. There's a reason we planted those explosives. Oh. Like nobody heard that coming. Oh, and there goes Barry. And then, so the thing kills Barry. Kills her. She shoots at it, which she's not even trained to shoot, but she shot at it to try to save the little girl. She could have hit the little girl. Um, I understand that's a re probably just a reaction thing, but it's still one of those. Um... Yeah, so she's gone. Barry's dying. And look at her response. Her reaction is just, hmm, I better pick up my gun. Like, you know Michelle Rodriguez from the first movie. Like, even though it's a clone, like, that's what I'm saying. They just don't, clones aren't people to anyone in these movies. <laughs> like, they don't care about clones. Um, and I can understand maybe some of you out there have that point of view too. Like, ah, oh, it's a clone. It's not a real person or something. But most of us would still struggle in the presence of a clone, we would struggle to, 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 to make that distinction if they were real or not. We would struggle with it um, because I believe most of us are decent people. And in a situation where if we saw a clone and then that clone died, there would be conflict within us. We wouldn't just stand there and go, hmm, dead weight. Heck, even in the Star Wars Clone Wars, they got sad when their clones died. You know, hey, if a clone's going to pick up a gun and defend you, it's just as real as you are. <laughs> like, if it's going to fight alongside you, it's just as real as you are, and you should mourn its death. You should show some emotion, other than, hmm, all right, let me get my gun now. I'm mad. It's like, whatever. It feels like a lot of times when Mila is reacting to something, she wasn't there on the day they filmed it. It feels like that, right? Because that shot where she's standing over Rain, um, who was, you know, on the ground dead with her neck broken there was just you saw her you saw Mila's legs so that could have been a uh, stand-in and then it cuts to a different shot of Mila reacting and then it cuts to a close-up of someone taking the gun where you don't see the who the person is obviously it's Mila and then it cuts back to the wide shot of Mila angry so it just feels like a lot of times she's not even there like with the other actors 
uh, properly reacting to the stuff they're doing. And that's probably why her performance is bad at times. It's probably because they have to either do pickup shots or Paul Anderson doesn't really know what she's supposed to be looking at in that moment. Um, and so he's just like, all right, stand here and look mad or stand here and look sad or confused. And then he just, in the editing room, they just pick one and it just doesn't match up properly <laughs> and they should have just spent more time editing. Um, so yeah, these, I don't know. So you get a, I get this, when I watch this movie, I feel like a real disconnect. I feel like a lot of times Alice in some of the scenes where she's reacting in a way where like when the little girl hugged her, she just, it's a close up of her staring. Uh, and you don't see the little girl hugging her in that close up. But you have the wide shot of her, the little girl hugging her. I'm like, well, why didn't she do some kind of emotional reaction in the wide shot? You know, and then in the close up, you know, I don't know, have her match it or something. And then this, they try to add in like, see, she's human. She's she's hurt. She's been shot. She's wounded. But then boom, she's right back to walking normal. And she goes, Ugh, touches her stomach. There's blood. And then she just like, okay, now I'm going to go do jump kicks and karate flips and I'm going to stab something in the head and, you know, I'm going to fight this monster head on with no superpowers and a bleeding stomach. It's ridiculous. It's not adding. That's the thing is you normally do that when you go, hey, we want to add some kind of tension. We want to make you feel like Alice isn't going to get out of it this time. Then you need to do that. You need to show her not acting superhuman. You need to show her struggling in each scene where she's walking and you need to follow that continuity of her limping more as the film progresses. Like, but that's too much work for Paul W. S. Anderson and these people. It's too much work to to make sure she's showing the 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 proper amount of decline in her her abilities as the story progresses. That's way too much work. And most other filmmakers would show that work and put in that work, but not these guys. They're they're too busy hanging out with their friends and and uh, you know creating stupid sequences where stunt people are dying and and uh and background actors are getting injured uh there so the scene where there was like a, a rising with all the zombies on it and they're in the filming process that rising crumbled and it injured 16 people that were extras as zombies and then there was a story where they were they were trying to make fun of it they were like oh we brought our employee uh, we brought all these extras to the hospital and the hospital had trouble just figuring out what their injuries actually were because they were dressed as zombies. So they didn't know what was zombies and what, like what, what was like makeup injury and what was real injury. And I'm like, that's, that's not a funny story. Someone could have died because the doctor and nurses couldn't assess their, their true injuries. That's not something to joke about. <laughs> it's like these fucking, they're like children. They're just like stupid children. <laughs> And then, yeah, so it, was, it wasn't a, another mouth that came out of it, but there was like the, the Las Plagas tentacles, which a liquor with Las Plagas, if you're a fan of the game, that, that makes no sense. Um, there are liquors in Resident Evil 5 with Ouroboros, but they're not like infected with Ouroboros. They're just like a, a different evolution of the liquor monster, but it's not like it doesn't have, it has a tongue that comes out, but not like the five tongues or whatever. And look at that. She had trouble ripping open the first one with Angie in it, but then she didn't have trouble grabbing those and why were those like why did that guy he's dead so why would he get cocooned up and what does the liquor look for there's already inconsistency of what it looks for it, it grabbed a random guard umbrella guard um, and it grabbed a, uh, the little girl I almost called her Angie it grabbed the little girl Becky but why this scene is the worst shootout ever. Again, you can you can tell the actors probably weren't even here on the same day. He jumps out and shoots. Then these characters jump out and shoot. They had Ada that whole time. They could have done that early on. It's ridiculous. This whole sequence is so stupid. And what does Barry care? Barry doesn't care about Ada. Yeah, but why? So, like, what was so heroic about that? And look, nobody, no one, Ada doesn't care that he's dead. Oh, and look, he's not dead. <laughs> he threw his gun up. So stupid. That's so stupid. 
for all he knew, he was going to get shot in the head, and that wouldn't have worked at all. Like, oh my God, Paul Anderson, I hate you. And in the wake of people getting injured and, and actresses uh, and stunt performers dying and uh, and the one the young lady in the sixth movie who lost her arm, which we'll talk more about when we do the commentary for last chapter, which we'll probably do like around September. Um, I'm not, I'm in no rush to do it. Maybe I'll do it in October. I'm in no rush to watch that movie. It's a giant pile of shit. It's about as bad as this movie is. Probably a little worse um, in some regards. Um, but the uh, the actress who lost her arm... Um, the, the, the scummy things that like Anderson and, and his production company and Jeremy Bolt and all these people try to do, uh, in the, in the aftermath of that incident were, were pretty scummy. Um, in fact, I'll put an article down below. I'll link it to the, the lady who was injured in the sixth movie and kind of her, like her telling her side of the story. I, th I think there was an article that went up not too long ago. Uh, I think she won her case, like she took him to court, um, or something like that. I can't, I can't remember the full story. I'll try to, I'll try to reread up on it when we do the commentary for the next movie, and I'll, I'll get her name right too because uh, I hate that I don't have it now. Um, but that's more something that happens in the next movie, so we'll, we'll save it for then. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because these movies shouldn't have some of the stunt scenes that they have in them. They just shouldn't. It makes no sense to like it's resident evil. So this is where they get in all their product placement. This is how you pay for movies. Reebok, um, GameStop, you know, Progressive or whatever. The, there was like a CarMax, I think. Maybe not Progressive. I think it was CarMax. But they had, um, you get all those billboards in these movies and you, you plug them. It's because when you're making a movie, even a shitty one like this, you the, Sony and Constantin Films, the people who make these movies and own the rights of Res Evil, they they don't have a hundred million dollars to make this movie. They have to go and get investors. Like that's that's part of the, that's part of the business side of movie making, is that y you do have to go get investors. You have to go get people to pitch in, um, and and buy like you know time in their in your movie. So you go to Reebok and you go, hey, we'll put a we're gonna recreate Times Square and we'll put a Reebok poster in Times Square and you'll be seen in the movie for you know you know, 30 seconds or, you know, a total of 30 seconds throughout the whole movie or something like that. And so Reebok goes, great, and this is going to be a big blockbuster Resident Evil movie that's going to play all over the world and people are going to see our brand name. So awesome. We will pay this amount of money for 30 seconds or whatever. And then you use that towards your budget or towards your marketing or whatever you need it for. Um, and that's part of movie making. So so it, I don't really slam too much on movies for doing product placement because it's an it is a necessity. But it's funny because these, if Umbrella was a real company, <laughs> that's what these, these would be uh, commercials for that company because there's Umbrella logos everywhere, but they have to balance that. They need to, so in this movie, they were like, we can't just have Alice in an underground lab. Like we have to have her, um, you know, like they have to be in Times Square so we can get more advertising bucks in there. Um, because the first movie was like what was set in a house and then the underground lab, they barely had any product placement, maybe a can of soda on one of the people's desks or a poster in one of their offices. They don't get, you don't get a lot of room for a product placement in a movie that small with a setting that small. So, um, so this movie, they obviously wanted the effects to be bigger. They wanted more in this. So they were like, all right, we'll, we'll recreate Times Square and we'll put a bunch of ads in there. Um, so now we have the scene, which is kind of from Code Veronica a little bit, where Leon, not Leon, um, uh, Steve and Claire, they get away in a snowplow, um, and then Nosferatu shows up, or no, Ver uh, Veronica or um, uh, Alexia, I guess, um, shows up to like take them down with the with her big tentacle monster. So in this, it's the sub coming up, which is also in Code Veronica. Was Wesker had a sub, and now all the characters are getting out and they're gonna fight. So meanwhile, remember. Alice, she was, has a stomach injury and she used the Ada Batman grappling gun 
to swing up, carry uh, the little girl and blow up the liquor back there, you know, unharmed and then land safely. And then now she's here. She's going to jump They're right there. A stomach injury that would have fucking killed. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, and again, I know some people are like, why are you looking for realism? Shut up. We've already gone through this. I already explained why I do that. And I don't care if you agree with me or not. Um, if she hurt her stomach and you want to build tension and you want me to wonder if she's going to survive this fight, then when she climbs off the thing, someone should have helped her down. But God forbid that happened because Alice is a badass character that doesn't need anyone's help, right? But yet you still want us to fear that she's not going to survive. But then you won't put in the work to make us feel that. You just you just want us to. And sorry, movie, but eat shit. Shut up, Leon. So this scene is so bad. But see, again, she's like, she's just willing to fight and kill. Um, she's willing to kill uh, Jill, but she's, why didn't she just go Jill? You're being brainwashed. I can help you. No, she's just like, no, we're just going to fight the two of you. And then you have, they mentioned Las Plagas. She goes, She's like, I'm going to, she like pulls out the injection thing and injects herself. And Leon has to give the exposition, the Las Plagas parasite. But that's all he says. He doesn't say it does this. He doesn't even go with full exposition. He just names it so that they can say, see, look, we put something in there for the fans. And it's like, you didn't, you assholes. And honestly, why didn't she inject herself before even coming out? Like, because you could have explained what Las Plagas was earlier, so that way Rain could inject herself on the sub before they come out. And then when these guys shoot her, they go, what the hell? And yeah, whatever. Look at this stupid shit. Her fingernails shoot out bullets. Ugh. Las Plagas doesn't have you do that. Like, if you notice, none of the other monsters did that. I mean, they basically wanted to make her Krauser, but again, they don't understand what makes Krauser Krauser, <laughs> you know? So it's like Paul Anderson's like, oh, well, there was someone in the, in the fourth game that had a Plagas that, you know, named Krauser that wasn't, uh, you know, that didn't turn into a mindless zombie. And if you shot him, like if Leon shot him, he still lived. It's like, yeah, but that was a boss fight. Like you, you don't understand the context of things, Paul W. Sanderson. <laughs> A lost plug is you could shoot them a couple times in the head and they're done. So, uh, whatever. Why am I even? This fight here with Jill and um, and uh, Alice, apparently this took, uh, like I think, like 10 or 12 days to film. Like I said, I don't think nonstop. They definitely probably took days off or breaks and stuff um, and probably shot a few other things in between um, or at the same time. But they started filming the scene, I think, on December 13th of the year this was being filmed. And then they... They, like 10 days later, they they wrapped. So they shot this pretty much all the way till the end of the uh, principal photography. So yeah, that's a, that's a lot of shooting for one fight scene that who gives a shit about, you know? Like, and she's, she, she's like, she got kicked in the stomach. She's twisting things around, but she's not acting like weakened. You know, she's not, her stomach all of a sudden doesn't hurt. Um... Ooh, Leon got a hit in. Yay. This is one of those things where I do complain a lot that they give Alice everything to do and they don't give other characters stuff to do. It's cool that Luther and Leon both get a fight in this and, it, you know, they're not really being helped by Alice. Um, that's pretty great. Although I wish Ada was awake and could be a part of the fight. Um, but, yeah, whatever. Imagine hiring um, an actress who's Chinese so you can get more money at the Chinese box office and then having her laying on the ground in the snow through most of this fight. Like, yeah, awesome, right? So Luther here, someone who actually has a connection to, um, to Alice, like Alice... Knew him from the last movie. They barely say a few words in this one together. 
Um, she doesn't act like she was, he was in, they were into each other in the last movie a little bit. There was chemistry, but in this one, they act like, you know, there, there's nothing super romantic going on. Um, but then like, he's going to, he's going to die and she's just going to stare and get angry. Boom. Some good shots in this fight between the two, but again, there's no, like, it would have been one of those things where Alice could have, like, she's bleeding out, she's dying, you can make it real tense where she's like, all right, I'm injured, and then Jill sees that she's injured and exploits it, and kicks her in the stomach a few times, punches her in the stomach, more blood's coming out, and then she realizes, she's like looking at the, the device on her chest, and she's like, all right, I, I don't need to physically beat Jill, I can't, Jill is actually too powerful for me, I just need to get the scarab off her chest. Um, and you could have had that, you know, be a thing, but instead they're just gonna like, they, they do it, but it just, it comes out of nowhere. Terminate project Alex. What, like, why do they want her killed? Um, and how can she remotely activate a snowplow, <laughs> snowplow's wheels by looking at it? Who cares? See? And now, it's like now she notices. Oh, wait. The thing on her chest. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? It's clear as day. You didn't notice that through the whole story? Ridiculous. This movie's ridiculous. Every time I watch this movie, I want my money back. <laughs> Even though I didn't pay to see this. Uh, so actually, someone bought me this box set. Um... I think it was a gift. I think it was a Christmas gift uh, like two years ago before I left LA. Um, it was like $10 or something like $15 and it's all six movies in one box set. Um, and someone, you know, someone who was just like, Hey man, I know you like resident evil. And you know, I was, I was like, well, I'm not going to be a dick. Like it's a, it's a, it's a gift. So that's when I realized, all right, I'm going to put it to use and I'm going to do commentary tracks <laughs> for all the movies. So that way I, you know, I get a little bit more out of the gift and I actually watch them. Cause I actually, when I was given the gift, I was debating on whether even watch to watch the movies. I was like, I don't know if I want to watch them. They gave me the this box set and the animated trilogy, uh, Degeneration, Damnation, and uh, whatever the third one was. The, the other one was called. Third one was oh Vendetta. Yeah, Vendetta. Um, so I have those. So the person who got me these, they spent like thirty bucks, and I got nine, you know, six live action Resident Evil movies and three CGI ones. That's pretty awesome. It's a great deal. Even for these crap movies, you know, that's only th like what, two bucks, two and a half, uh, two fifty a movie or something like that. Like, uh, it's not bad. That's about what I would pay for these. But, uh, but still I did not pay for these, but even though I didn't pay for it and I'm watching the Blu-ray that I own, uh, that was gifted to me, I still want my money back. <laughs> I want the money back for the person who bought this from me. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, so yeah, so now Alice looks under under the ice and sees zombies swimming which is weird because zombie there should be no water as established in the third movie <laughs> but there's a lot of water in this movie yeah they were like there's no water and ice dried up and there's nothing and here we go my favorite jill could have just shot uh you know jill could have come up with this plan uh you know jill could have uh you know, shot the ice or whatever. Um, but nope, it's got to be Alice. And I love that. You can't kill me. Yes, you can. A lost Plagueis is not like a Wesker. Like, what are you doing? Like, I don't know, whatever. Again, they just wanted it so they could have all their friends back, which I get it. It's fine. Like Adam Sandler does that. He, you know, he's just like, hey, a lot of these actors, no one's going to hire and I like them, and, and they've been through everything with me, so I'm loyal to them. I want to put them in my movie. I get it. But Michelle Rodriguez, she's got a franchise. She's got Fast and the Furious. Like, she's on to other things. Common, uh, Colin Salmon, the guy who plays one, he's a great actor, and I've seen him in other things. Um, I just, uh, I don't know. Bringing him back could have been neat if you brought him back as, like, I don't know, as, like, a different character. You could have been, like, but the second you start, they start bringing clones into this franchise and you're just like, wait a minute. So Umbrella can clone people. It can, 
it can do so it can recreate cities and run simulations like what is it doing messing with viruses and wiping out the human population through viruses like and mutating things into monsters like what's the what's the gain there i don't get it but yeah here you go you got your this lady who uh, was hired they're like we're gonna bring ada in this movie and we want to capture you know we want this to do bigger in china and, and make more money in other you know in other territories around the world so we're going to bring in more diverse cast and it's like great do that but your one goal was you wanted to you know bring in a bigger chinese audience and have people root for this young lady from china to play playing this character ada and then you have her unconscious through the final battle and you're like what the hell and then of course we have to have alice black out because if she stays awake right now any emotion of her hugging the little girl who we also don't see in this end sequence so we don't even really you know know too much like if what her state of mind is Luther's dead, so she didn't have respond. She didn't have time to respond to Luther's death. We just need another scene where she wakes up because that's all Paul Anderson does. He's like, I want everyone to see my wife wake up in these movies. <laughs> so we have to see every movie she wakes up like three or four times. We have to see a close up of her eye opening up after she was knocked unconscious or after she's been sleeping or something boring like that. And it's such a shame because, like I said, Sienna Glory, who plays Jill, she looks great Like she, as Jill. The lady who plays um, uh, Ada back there, she looks great. The guy who plays Leon does not look great, and nor does he sound great or act great, uh, in my opinion. Um, and again, you have the scene where like they go, glad to have you back, glad to have you back. Why not do that in a two shot? Like that shot right there. Why didn't they do it there? Where everyone's like, you can see everyone actually acting. Why do it in cutaways? <laughs> like, and then this scene where he's like, I'm going to hold your leg and be a creep. Yeah, why? Like, why? <laughs> like, I know Leon's kind of a little womanizing in the fourth game, but why, like, grab her leg? Like, I don't know. Fucking whatever. Whatever. And here we are in the White House, the end of the movie, where they somehow got here safely from wherever the hell that facility was. They got to Washington, D.C., so they flew overseas, and like over the ocean and stuff. They got here safely, and you find out Wesker is as president, which is neat. Actually, I think that's a neat concept. Like, okay, the world is, is gone to crap. We're in our final battle, and Wesker, as evil as he is, He's like, I, I wanted to be in control and I don't have control. Um, so I'm sitting as president <laughs> right now and we're going to build an alliance and I need you with your superpowers back. So he runs around the table to give her her powers back and then leads her up to the roof to show her the chaos. And then when you watch the sixth movie, it's just in the service of another at that attack being planned by Wesker to kill all the remaining survivors in the world. So why give Alice her powers back? If you if you just wanted to kill all the survivors and Alice, why even break her out of that last facility? Why not just blow it up and have her die underwater? There's no way she could have got out of there if you just flooded the place the way they did when they broke her out. These movies, if you are an aspiring writer or creator out there, um, do me a favor and don't ever make anything like these movies. Ever, ever, please, nothing like them, ever. Like if you're gonna do something with Resident Evil, try to do, try to at least add something to your characters. Give them something, anything, other than the the, the scraps that these characters get. And like I, I use the term characters loosely when I describe the people in these movies, um, because you, it's like you get good enough actors to they can do the job if you just let them, but you don't let them. And the next movie, look at you end with this. This is humanity's last stand. And we got to stand against the, the force of him. I've lost control. I'm Wesker. I was the bad guy. I've lost control. We're at the White House. Okay, so the next movie, it's going to start off at the White House and it's going to be them fighting against Umbrella, right? And, you know, taking down the, the final threats and you're going to learn people in that human camp. You're going to learn who they are and you're gonna they're going to develop new characters. Nope. All of this in the next movie it's the aftermath of this battle and Leon's gone 
and Ada's gone, dead, Jill's dead, the little girl's probably dead. Like, nothing matters. None of this matters. This is just to get a, a big money shot, expensive money shot at the end of the movie. But it is it does not matter. In the next movie, they're just going to ignore it. And they're going to have Alice immediately wake up, get on a motorcycle, and head to Raccoon City in the next movie. Why? Why not just lure her to Raccoon City in this movie? Um, I think this is, I don't know the band. I know it's, I know it's, a uh, Chino Marino from, uh, Deftone singing. The song's called Hexus, but I, I can't remember if it's Skrillex or who does the music part. Um, anyway, so, oh, Lee Bingbing, that's her name. The, the lady who plays Ada. I, th I was going to say Bingbing earlier, but I, I was like, no, that can't, that's not it. But it turns out that is her name. Anyway, and yeah, they call the Axemen, instead of the Executioners, they call them the Axemen. Uh, Sergeant Peyton Wells. So those, th there's a lot of um, flashback footage used in this at the beginning. And, uh, and so they credited all those, those actors and actresses. <coughs> anyway, yeah, so this movie is just a pile of garbage. Uh, I, I really just... I know I just rambled and ranted at ra random times. I just probably felt less like a commentary in to some regard. Um, that, you know, cause some of my other ones, I feel like at least the first one, I felt like I was a, trying to be a little more informative, but I also figure if you want more information, you can always just watch these movies with the actual commentaries on them. Um, the first movie has some good commentary tracks, but the, the ones after that, I feel like I didn't really learn too much and just made me like the movies even less. Uh, than I already did, which was not a lot. Um, but this movie came out in September of 2012 uh, around the world. Like I think came out in Tokyo like 10 days or 11 days before it came out in the U.S. <laughs> so so there was, I think, people spoiling the movie around that time. Um, the music by the, in this movie, by the way, is by Tom and Andy, who they, they do okay music. I just, you know, and I guess it fits the tone of the movie. But like I said, if... This movie, if you really wanted to balance tension and action, they failed, in my opinion. There's no tension in this movie. There's there's just action. And there's, like, surface-level stuff. Like, oh, look, she's injured. Let's have a scene where she touches her stomach and you see blood. And then 20 minutes later, she'll touch her stomach again and see blood. But in between those two scenes, she acts completely normal. And after the second time she touches her stomach, she's going to act completely normal. So what's the point of her even having an injured stomach then? It's just... You know, um, I, this also was the second movie, I think, in the franchise that was shot in 3D. Um, they used a different camera, I think, with this one. Um, they because there was like a, a Sony 3D, you know, the one that James Cameron used for Avatar. That was what they filmed the fourth one with. This one, I think, used uh, like the, the red camera, which was like, I don't know, it's like half the size of the, the previous camera they used. Um, probably half as noisy, too. Um, but yeah. So there's some technical stuff if you want to know what they use to film this movie. The movies look okay, but I think that's the camera doing as much work as it can and maybe some of the visual effects people doing the best work they can do um, and the makeup people doing the best work they can do. I think that's what I'm going to contribute in the set designers and stuff, Like even though a lot of sets are green screen. Um, but a lot of that stuff, that's when you say, oh, this movie's visually good. I'm like, yeah, but I wouldn't blame that on the director. I wouldn't give the credit to the director or even somewhat the cinematographer to some degree. Um because the, the shots are still bad, like uh, some of them. Like they're flat, you know, close-ups when you don't need a close-up. Two, a two-shot when you don't, you, like it's like the scene where Jill and uh, and Alice are talking, the close-ups, they should have inverted that. And they should have had the, the, the scenes where they're saying like, hey, I'm glad you're okay. I'm glad you are too. That should have been in a two-shot. That would have looked much nicer with the background. You got more going on. And then you cut to like maybe them smiling as close-ups, you know, after that moment. Um, so it's just a matter of like, they clearly shot all this stuff, but whoever the editors were working with Paul, they just chose a lot of the wrong footage to edit in, in my opinion. Um, and that gets more apparent in the next movie. Whoever the editor was on the sixth movie should be fired and never edit again. Honestly, I'm not one for saying someone shouldn't have their job or career, except for the person who directed, or for, for well, Paul Anderson, you should never write again, in my opinion. Uh, the person who edited Resident Evil Final Chapter, you should never edit again. And we'll talk about that in the final chapter when we watch that. Um, 
but yeah, this uh, originally I think this movie they were gonna film five and six back to back, and Paul Anderson was like, no, that's too much. Like that's too much work for me. You know, I got I'm gonna have to make the continuity make sense, and you know, and that's just too much work. So why don't we just focus on five, and then like three years after five, I'll start getting to work on the the sixth and final one, um, and it'll just retcon everything and make no sense. And isn't that just much better? And you know someone stupid apparently said yes yes it is better let's do that paul anderson you're so full of great ideas i love you let's keep making movies together we're geniuses and it's like yeah i, I just laugh that you know these guys they'll they'll celebrate they'll be like hey we we spent 80 you know 70 million dollars budget for this movie and then we spent another 70 million to market it and we made you know like half a million dollars back or something like that or four hundred thousand dollars back actually i think i can find that information out of like what was um the budget for this movie was 65 million, right? So that you times that by two, that's 120 million, because you or 100 and um, uh, 30 million, right? Because so, it's a 65 and 65. So you got 130 million dollar budget. Uh, that includes marketing and everything like that. The box office was 240 million dollars. So that means it grossed 110 million dollars. But like I said, the studio does not get to keep all 110 of that million. They got to split that up, sharing it with, uh, you know, uh, movie theater chains, stuff like that. So they, they don't get to have all that 110 million. So this movie did not make that much money if it made that much at all. Um, you know, after they pay everyone back and get everyone's investments back and stuff like who knows if this movie actually turned a profit. Um, and then they'll sit there and, and pat themselves on the back and say, yeah, it took us six movies, but we broke a billion dollars. And it's like, how pathetic are you where you think that's a victory? Like, I'm sorry, but, you know, if you do a really good Resident Evil movie and you do a good job and you market it well and you and you have characters that are semi-interesting and you give more than what people are expecting, because now people are expecting just shit movies. When you hear the name Resident Evil, they're going to go, oh, yeah, those movies sucked. Like, I'm, I'm expecting the worst. I, my expectations are low. If you can actually surprise them and actually make something that's pretty good and that stands the test of time, like, you know, the way horror movies were like in the 70s and 80s with Halloween, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, you know, Freddy and Jason and all those movies. Like, if you can actually make something that stands the test of time, like Scream or something, you make, you put Resident Evil in a, and it gets associated with titles like that, you won't have to take six movies to make a billion dollars. You could probably do it in three uh, if, you're, if you do it right. You spend 70 million on each movie then your box office should be like half a million dollars or half a, yeah, half a billion dollars. Sorry. Um, not half a million. So if you spend, uh, you know, 65 million on a budget, 65 million marketing it, that's 130 million. And then you make a profit of 500 something million. Then that's a, that's a much better turnout than this movie. That's twice as good as this movie did. Um, and then you do that a second time and then you do that a third time. And by the third one, if you, especially if you make it at the end of a trilogy or something, uh, you will have passed a billion dollars in half the movies this franchise took to make to get to a billion. Um, so yeah, so just I don't know these movies, and they, I love that they pat themselves on the back for for barely doing anything. Like yeah, you guys are real awesome. <laughs> you guys, you guys are amazing. Constantin Films and and uh, and everyone that put these movies together, and Paul Anderson and Jeremy Bolt, and all, you, you guys are so awesome. You. You you take twice as long to do something you should have done um, earlier. Like yeah, I'm gonna I'm not gonna pat you on the back. Uh, and you get people hurt in the process and killed and maimed and losing limbs um, for scenes that should not even be in Resident Evil movies. You shouldn't have an SUV ramping off of something and crashing into something or uh, you know platforms that could collapse with people on them. You know it's like you're putting all these things in these movies that don't need to be there. You know you're, you're putting people's lives at risk so you can hang out with your friends to make a, another mediocre movie. Not even a mediocre movie that these ones aren't, these movies five Resident Evil five and six aren't even worthy enough to be called mediocre. In my opinion, they're that they're that bad to me. And I told you I wasn't going to be nice. And I know some of you guys may not agree and you probably don't like hearing me just bitch about things for, um, you know, an hour and a half or whatever, but, uh, or hour and 40 minutes now, uh, but, uh, and I don't like doing it either. So I try to point out a few positive or things that I did like, but it's hard to do it in this movie and it's really hard to do it in the next movie. So, um, so we'll talk about that when we get there. The next film, Resident Evil, the final chapter, the last one. Thank God I'm so done watching these. I don't, I'm still deciding if I'm going to do a commentary like this for the CGI movies or if I'll just record reviews for them. Um, I might just record reviews. I don't know if I'll do full commentaries. Um, but, uh, 
but I do like those more than these movies. I still don't think the CGI movies are great, but they're certainly better than these live action movies in my opinion. So we'll get into more of that later. So the movie just ended, the credits just ended, and I'm gonna let you guys go. Thank you so much for watching this and listening to this. Um, hopefully you enjoyed the footage that I put of Resident Evil 8. I try to cut out you know, some of the cutscenes, so hopefully there's not a ton of spoilers in it for you. Um, you know, and I, I, that's what I was hoping for is just to cut out most of the cutscenes or skip them at least in my playthrough. Uh, cause I kind of did like a semi speed run of Resident Evil 8. And I was like, oh, I know what I'm going to use this footage for. And so please go pick up Resident Evil 8. If you haven't bought it yet, it's, uh, it's really fun. I liked it. I really like Resident Evil 7. Um, I think I like 7 more than 8, but 8 had some good moments in it. And I think it's a good continuation. And, uh, you know, I'm curious to see where the franchise goes from here. Um, and the movie franchise, I'm curious to see that go in a better direction. And hopefully it will. We'll have to find out. We'll have to wait and find out because the next movie, it's called Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City. I'm not a fan of the title, um, to be honest with you. I wish they would have just called it Resident Evil Biohazard or something along those lines. But the uh, the movie is going to be a re, uh, kind of a retelling, a reimagining of the first two video games. And I don't know how they're going to pull that off. Fan fiction films typically do that where they, they're like, oh, let's cram in multiple characters from multiple different games. Um, so... It's going to be hard. I don't know. It's hard. I'm going to have to wait for a trailer. I am a little bit excited for it, though. Um, uh, and we obviously talk about that here on the show a lot. So I'll have more of those episodes, including the very next one. We got a new cast member for the new movie uh, playing another Resident Evil 1 character um, and someone who's mentioned also in Resident Evil 0, I think. So we'll talk about that in the next episode. But for now, um, you know, this is it for, for this. And, uh, and, you know, and I'll have more Welcome to Raccoon City content coming up. And I'll have my Infinite Darkness Resident Evil Netflix animated show review I'll have that go up um, as soon as that show drops as well. So, uh, so thank you for watching this. Thanks for, you know, indulging me and 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 hanging with me on these commentary tracks. For those of you who listen and and uh, you know and enjoy, hopefully. Um, if you don't though, if you have any criticisms for me, please let me know in the comments down below. And as always, we'll continue our conversation down there. Uh, thanks so much for watching the show. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll see you in the future. Peace.